graduate of Eastern from the psychology department. And my minor was in African American studies. Now, Professor Albert wanted me to discuss another topic, but I felt more passionate about this being a psych major because the men and the women that I would discuss were never mentioned in any of the classes that I had the four years that I took psychology. The African American Studies Department was more beneficial in learning about me and my people. I was asked to do a research paper that dealt with my discipline and included in African American Studies. So I chose black psychologists because I had, there was names in passing, but I didn't know that they were psychologists and they were African Americans. The concerns of black psychology revolve around the development of a discipline which not only studies the behavior of black persons, but seeks to transform them into self-conscious agents of their own mental and political liberation. So writes Malana Karanga in the chapter on black psychology in his now famous introduction to black studies, first published nearly 30 years ago in 1982. The concerns about the psychological and psychiatric well-being of black people, Karanga says, are characterized by three principles. The critique and rejection of the methodology, ideology, and conclusions of Eurocentric psychology. The need for an Afrocentric model of scholarship and therapy, and the development of self-conscious interventions and the struggle for a black and human environment. Karengo also describes the work of the Association of Black Psychologists, the ABP, and the development of its three schools of psychological thought and practice, the traditional school, the reformist school, and the radical school which make use of the three principles that I said. Empirically and develop self-conscious methodologies of counseling and therapy for African Americans. This paper seeks to provide an overview of the responses of African American psychologists to the problems and challenges of Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism in official psychology. So we begin by tracing the origins of black psychology to the 1920s when Francis Sumner, the first African American to receive a PhD in psychology from Clark University in Massachusetts in 1920. A main concern of Sumner and succeeding psychologists was to engage in research and publication that dispelled white racist views of African Americans. Sumner and his colleagues also wanted to introduce psychology programs to black colleges and provide improved psychological services to the African American community. Racial barriers in the 1920s made it very difficult, if not outright impossible, to establish an independent Black Psychological Association. In 1938, however, Herman Kennedy of West Virginia State College formed the Black Psychologist Caucus. Kennedy's goal was to promote teaching, stimulate research, set up qualifications for teachers of psychology, and assist black colleges in training and selecting psychologists. Now, 30 years later, in 1968, with the emergence of black nationalism and the power movements, black psychologists began to develop their own caucuses and predominantly mainstream professional 
psychological organizations. It was in this year that the Association for Black Psychology was formed and began its work by critiquing the APA, the American Psychological Association, for its failures to address and scholarship as well in counseling and therapy the consequences for blacks, the racialist ethos that has historically dominated American society, culture, and public policy. This critique led to these pioneering black psychologists to the realization that they are black people first and psychologists second. They also vowed not to ignore the exploitation of the black community. And they concern themselves with the struggle of black people's dignity and equality. Their collaboration and efforts resulted in the emergence of the three black school of psychology described by Karanga in his introduction to black studies. Using chosen representatives of each school, Karanga discusses their scholastic, political, and theoretical perspectives as the means of explaining the orientation of each school. So we begin with the traditional school, which according to Karanga is characterized by its defensive and or reactive posture, lack of support for the development of black psychology, preoccupation with the changing white attitudes and the inability to offer substantial correctives to the racist practice it criticizes. Kenneth Clark, the first and only African American to hold the position of the president of the APA, is the best known representative for the traditional school. His book, The Dark Ghetto, Dilemma of Social Power, which I would consider Clark's magnum opus, perhaps provide an eloquent exemplification of the traditional school's defining characteristic, which is the conventional examination of segregation. Clark writes that racial segregation, like all other forms of cruelty and tyranny, debases all human beings, those who are victims, those who are victimized, and in quite sort of ways, those who are merely accessories. This central element in Clark's argument is that racial segregation bequeaths humanity with only victims. Two other adherents of the traditional school are William Greer and Price Cobbs, who are principally drawing the attention of white supremacists to the effects of black people of their racist attitudes in the hopes of affecting positive change in white supremacist behavior and mindset. The concept of black rage, which is central to Greer and Cobb's work, they write, the psyche of black men have been distorted by the shadows of the past. From this perspective, Greer and Cobb have tended to dwell on the oppressive effects of slavery and how the peculiar institution has had such a proud, profound effect on the psychological makeup of African Americans. Criticism of Greer and Cobbs has tended to center around two critical issues. Inability to see significant distinctness in the life of African Americans and their uncritical acceptance of European psychological principles as being applicable to all humanity, regardless of race. The second school of black psychology, the reformist school, emerged during a period of historical change, but maintains, like the traditional school, concerns over white attitudes and behaviors. Since the school promotes Afrocentric psychology, its focus, like that of the, of the traditional school, 
has been one that is preoccupied with the need to change white attitude through changes in public policy. Charles Thomas, one of the founders of the Association of Black Psychologists, played an influential role in bridging the traditional and reformist schools of African American psychology by attempting a synthesis, writes Karanga, of the social and disciplined criticism of the traditional school and by making demands for the development of new models of professional engagement from the radical schools. Thomas, one of the school's leading lights, developed this approach to psychology and psychiatry with his idea of intrusive intervention and the methodology for changing the attitudes of blacks through self-mastery, social competence, and personal fulfillment. Thomas argues that social scientists must have an ethical responsibility in changing the socio-political condition of African Americans. He has also expressed concern over the damage done by social scientists. If blackness came into existence as a healthy support state, writes Thomas, it cannot be logically used as a symptom symptomatology of maladaptive behavior. <clears throat> 